It, it, my name is Joshua Landis, and I'm the director of the center of the Farzani Family Center for Iranian and Persian Gulf Studies. And it's my great pleasure today to be able to um, welcome our, our guest here tonight. But first, I want to um, say a few words about the Farzani uh, brothers who have sponsored, the Farzani family who have, who have sponsored this, this uh, center. And it is, it's my pleasure to thank the Farzani brothers, Muhammad and Jalal, for their generous support of the College of International Studies and the University of Oklahoma more broadly. And not only have they been key to building the Farzani Family Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies, which now has uh, three tenure track lines, an instructor, and a, hopefully another tenure track line coming. Um, but they've funded an architecture program, fine Persian music series, and Oklahoma is very lucky to have such farsighted and committed patrons. Um, so we thank you very much for that. And, and um, I want to thank Marjan Serafipour, um, who has been, uh, you know, organizing this behind the scenes. So that's, um, we're very grateful to her. And finally, I want to introduce um, Professor um, Marashi, who is going to carry out the interview with our speaker today, and he'll interview uh, Kaveh Madani. So Afshin Marashi is the Farzani family chair in modern Iranian history at the University of Oklahoma. He was the founding director of the Farzani family center for almost 10 years, and he really built it into the, uh, to the center that it is today. So I'm very lucky to be able to stand on his shoulders here. His first book was Nationalizing Iran, Culture, Power in the State, 1870 to 1940. And um, he's just come out with a second book. He's of course got an edited book too, which I won't speak about, but his, his last book um, is really a, a powerhouse. And uh, he it called Exile and the Nation, the Parsi Community of India and the Making of Modern Iran. And it, it's really, revolutionizes our understanding of modern uh, Iranian nationalism. And Dr. Marashi also serves as a co-editor of a book series at the uh, University of Texas Press. He's been on the editorial board of Ismets, our flagship journal for Middle Eastern studies. So we are very proud to have him uh, being moderate at our, at our center and moderating this talk today. So with that, without further ado, thank you very much. And I pass the baton to you. Well, thank you, Josh. Thank you for the very kind, generous introduction. And um, yes, as you mentioned, it, it's my, my job to moderate the discussion with Kaveh, and I'll do a very brief introduction of him as well. And for all of our, I want to thank all the members of our uh, audience, too, who are uh, have logged in and have joined us from literally all over the world. So it's, it's wonderful that we were able to kind of reach such a broad audience. I think it really speaks to Kaveh's uh, his profile and his position that he's attracted such a following for a, an event like this. Uh, I, and in our sort of arrangement for this event, one thing that we had tried to uh, set this up is really try to encourage audience participation. Uh, so Kave and I will begin our discussion and we, I, we have some questions that we'll sort of initiate our conversation with. But I'd really like to invite uh, our audience members to go ahead and use the Q&A function uh, within the uh, Zoom uh, window and go ahead and type in your questions. Uh, and as soon as we get a, a good, good roster of questions, uh, we can transition to uh, uh, having those questions lead some of our discussion as well. So uh, he and I will start, but hopefully we can uh, invite you all to participate uh, as well. Uh, so let me give a, a very brief introduction to Kaveh Madani. Uh, Kaveh is an environmental scientist educator and activist. Uh, he, his work uh, is at the intersection of science, policy, and society. Uh, he's currently a visiting professor at the Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College in London, uh, and is also the Henry Hart Rice Senior Fellow at the Macmillan Center uh, for International and Area Studies at Yale University. Uh, he has also previously served as the, as the deputy head of Iran's uh, Department of Environment, uh, as well as holding a, num a number of other uh, government positions there. Uh, Dr. Madani received his undergraduate degree at the University of Tabriz, 
and he completed his MA degree in environmental science at the University of Lund and his PhD in civil and environmental engineering at the University of California at, at Davis. Uh, and like many of you, I've been following Kaveh's work for a long time. Uh, and uh, I, I'm really glad that we're able to invite him to uh, join us here in Norman, even if it's only virtually. So welcome to Norman, Oklahoma, Kaveh. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the uh, invitation. Thanks for the generous um, introduction. It's a pleasure to be there uh, virtually. I, I hope that one day I can visit your, your um, campus. I'm all, you know, thankful to Professor Linus and, and Majal Seyapipur and yourself for organizing this and, and very thankful to the audience who have joined us. I saw people tweeting and complaining that this is midnight in, in Iran and they, they're very sleepy right now. So to those That's people, I should say that this will get recorded and, and um, you know, they can uh, w watch it later on if, if needed. I assume it's getting recorded, yes? Yeah, I'm pretty so, sure, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. yes, it is. We'll have yeah. it posted by tomorrow. All righty, thank you. And, and I'm also thankful to the, um, you know, the to, to your center and the Farzanev family. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of good things happening in Oklahoma, both Oklahoma State University and University of Oklahoma. Um, I'm glad that finally someone has interest in, in modern Iran and, 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 and the contemporary Iran. This is, this is really missing from um, most Iranian studies centers um, around the world, I would say. We still uh, you know, have a hard time understanding Iran and, and um, a lot of us who are in, in non-humanities, I would say, fields, um, who have something to offer and, and, and insights to offer and talk about Iran, um, don't get involved in Iran discussions. I hear that this is happening in Oklahoma. So congratulations to uh, you, you know, the, the two universities and the Farzani family for supporting uh, these efforts. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're definitely trying to innovate the field here as well. Uh, well, let me just sort of try to begin our discussion uh, and maybe the, the place to start is really at the, the most general level for the un, un, uninitiated in, in the field of environmental studies, and I include myself in that. If, you know, from your perspective, if you were to kind of discuss the, the general challenges and problems relating to the environment in, in the Middle East region as a whole, uh, what would you say are, are some of those, the most important ones for us to maybe begin our discussion thinking about? Good question. Um, you know, so, so we, we all know the stories, right? So we're talking about a drier re region of the world. So when we say drier, it's relative to the rest of the world. We are talking about a region which receives uh, less precipitation, much less precipitation. So water availability has been always limited in, in that part of the world, um, a region which is different from other parts of the world in terms of energy availability. Um, so um, you know, there are major oil producing companies, oil and gas producing companies in the region, uh, countries which never um, had major concerns, at least in the last last decades or, you know, or last century in this century about energy production, but they, ha they were always worried about water and food. When you don't have water, you your food production is always uh, also limited. And that's a major challenge for, for countries with growing economies, which start with developing an, with their agricultural sector and investing in their agricultural sector. So food security has been always a paranoia for the Middle Eastern leaders and water insecurity has been a big deal. Now, also this, this part of the world is, is, is different from many parts of the world, uh, which, which might have the issue of water shortage. Um, uh, and, and that is the, the arrogance that we have because of having, um, much a lot of resources and I include myself because a lot of people still think this way and I was I grew up in Iran and, and then thought in the same way I did study engineering and we had the mentality of of spending money and talent for for coping with our problems or solving our problems so so we never th treated water as a limit to growth instead we said let's let's 
I'll build dams, let's dig deeper, let's, um, let's transfer water, let's desalinate water to solve the problem. And that sort of mentality is, is another important thing that we have to understand about the Middle East, something which has caused a lot of problems down the road. For a lot of us in, in, in North America, for example, we, we used to think that the problems in the Middle East the environmental problems in the Middle East are similar to the environmental problems in the US West in the 60s and 70s. So you, you develop structurally, you, you build, build a lot of infrastructure and then you realize that you have affected the environment, you're causing problems and then there are green revolutions and, and, and a comeback for the environment, giving more rights to the environment and taking care of the environment. That was true to an extent, but what makes the, the, the region different and unique is the, its socioeconomic context. We are dealing with, with, with a good number of countries which are having problems dealing and coping with their so many problems in the moment. So we have the issue of war, tension, uh, conflicts, and sanctions and, and so many other things, as well as the, the wrong mentality of the leaders who don't see these problems. Now, as a result of development and rapid development and no attention to the environment, we have seen all the problems that um, an environmental scientist can wish for, <laughs> for, for, for studies. Um, so we have the issue of air pollution, we have the issue of solid waste and, and waste in general. Um, water po pollution is another problem that is more, more, you know, is more recent. We, we used to think mostly about water quantity, but now we are so concerned about water quality as well. Um, and then we, we have other issues. We did deforest, you know, deforestation caused um, um, more floods, for example, um, desertification, um, sand and dust storms, a new problem, you know, in, in many parts of the region. So, so a, a, a kind of a menu of any problem that you can think of, including wildfires and, you know, all those disasters that we, we, we hear about. Um, we don't get tornadoes, though over there much <laughs> not as often not as often well th that's actually a very good place to start and it really sets the the scope of the problems across the region uh, maybe i can ask you to kind of maybe think about how iran fits into that picture is there anything maybe unique about the environmental challenges uh within that part of the middle east that you might think sort of stands out or differentiates it from the rest of the region Iran is a vast country with with a you know huge uh, climatic um, variability. Um, you know, so the problems that Iran is experiencing are are different in nature. You go to the north of Iran, uh, you have the issue of waste, water quality, and so many other things. You go to the uh, southwest, you have the issue of dust storms and and drying wetlands and um, diverted water, which which have caused a problem. Um, you go to the east of the country, you see. Um, um, it, close to the Afghanistan border, the dead Hamoun and lots, you know, people who had to migrate and, and having problems finding even jobs and make a living. You go to, to, you know, Northwest Iran and Central Iran issues with groundwater and lots of other problems. So this sort of variability that we have in Iran is, is also making our, our environmental problems variable. Across the country though, we have all, all these problems that I, I, I mentioned in response to your previous question. Question. Um, but one thing to note about Iran is also uh, when, when Iran started its development, uh, I would say, um, era uh, or structural development era, you know, with, with the um, uh, oil production and, and its money, then, you know, technocratic thoughts and the, the revolution, I would say, in Iran, the, the infrastructural. Um, the infrastructure and engineering revolution started in Iran. It came with a lot of benefits, um, agricultural expansion, uh, jobs, industries, and so on. Um, this was, Iran was ahead of the curve in the region in that regard. Of course, the problems Iran's, uh, Iran experienced uh, for that reason also um, started earlier. So I say that Iran is ahead of the curve in terms of um, some environmental problem production. So some of the environmental problems that we are talking about in Iran uh, are yet to be developed in some other countries in the region. Um, of course, when you start earlier, your mentality, access to technology and understanding of the environmental science is also different. So the problems of Dubai cannot be compared easily with problems of, of Tehran because their development have, have happened. 
has happened in, 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 in two different eras. Um, Iran is also very unique in terms of the problems it has been going through and how it's, it's uh, let's say, um, the, you know, the revolution um, the mentality before the revolution, uh, after the the spike of the oil prices, and and right after the revolution with the Iran Iraq war, with with this um, the issue of Iranians wanting to stand on their own feet, uh, producing their own food, being secure, being uh, being self sufficient, um, a lot of these um, ideologies have come at a very huge cost for the country and for its people. And that is what makes us unique, what makes Iran unique. And I would say another important thing uh, is, is, um, is the, the environmental awareness in Iran. I, I give credit to the Iranian people for being concerned about the environment. Too bad that they can't turn their concern into action, um, into a change at the high level. But Again, if you think about what is happening in the Iranian social media, Iranian media, people talking about uh, problems, environment is has become a concern for for the for many Iranians. Um, this has happened again because of um, major problems. Uh, I I would myself think that um, Lake Rumia tragedy was a turning point in, in, in modern history of Iran in, 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 in when it comes to the environment. So the post, um, post um, you know, tragedy area is, is, is different. So people started uh, expressing concern and, and talking about it. And, and this has, you know, um, this is to an extent that the, the, the leaders of the country are now concerned about um, and environmental problems and the environmental ins insecurity problems that this this sort of um, you know public concern can cause because because when environment is very different from other things that the Iranians are concerned about you know mm -hmm. freedom democracy women's rights um, LGBT and other things um, in, when it comes to the environment there is nothing against the Sharia and, and Islam. Um, you no matter which which religion you have, uh, if you believe in God or not, you care about the environment. You get concerned about how Moon Zayan, the root and Lake Rumia. No matter where you come from, with, with you know which part of the country you get sad and by seeing images of these places, you know getting destroyed. So environment has a un unique uniting power. And it is bringing people together. So people express concern about the environment. You cannot call them agents of the enemy. You cannot call them, you know, when people can't breathe and complain about air pollution in Tehran, you cannot accuse every one of them to, you know, of, of working for Israel or, or being the agent of, of the enemy. So, so that, that is also causing a lot of concerns for the environment. So we see some sort of a securitization of the environmental space in response to the environmental awareness growth in Iran, including the, the rising activities of the environmental NGOs. At the time I was the deputy head of Iran's Department of Environment, we had 850 registered and approved environmental NGOs. And when we say registered and approved, it means they have gone through an extensive process, clearance and lots of things, and they have gotten approval. At this time, it's more than a thousand. Um, this, this reflects actually at least like you know the concerns of of the system 1000 is is a huge number for a country which which is dealing with lots of other problems and the, you know and has people who are concerned about lots of primary uh, um, needs and, and 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 so on well i want to ask you about a couple of things that you mentioned there but before i get into that i want to encourage our audience members to go ahead and type in your questions into the q and a window and if you click on the bottom and we'll start collecting those and, and that will be great thank you for that and, and keep them coming um you mentioned uh lake urmia and uh, the zayan derud uh environmental problem and i think for some of us maybe it's something we know about we've read about and we've heard about and you know as with so much of things that happen in iran we, we don't really know all the facts or what to believe can you maybe from your perspective just perspective give us a, a little bit of a summary of those two cases because it, i think it, it kind of maybe brings together a lot of the things that you're you're talking about um simply put it's the issue of mass balance um you know the 
you you are making the the the, the system bankrupt. So so you know to make it easy, let's think about let let's uh, consider um, surface water as your checking account. Uh, surface water, you know, water flowing on 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 the surface. Is, is fed by, by precipitation. It's your salary. You put it in your, your checking account and you use your checking account. When you run out of your checking account, you go your, to your, your um, saving account, groundwater. Um, you start tapping into it. But that's there to, to give you, um, you know, the opportunity uh, to, to use it when, when needed, not permanently. But if you exhaust your checking account and then you go and exhaust your, your saving account and whatever you have inherited from your ancestors, then you are bankrupt. The problem is that we didn't think, as I said you know, early on, we didn't think, um, we didn't consider water as a limit to growth. We, we simply said, let's go ahead and, and do things. Let's, let's use our technology. Let's use our talent to solve the problem. So what did we do, what did we do in the Lake Rumia Basin? Uh, we wanted growth, um, urbanization happen. We wanted to create jobs. We wanted farmers to be happy. Uh, we wanted to create construction jobs and the construction industry always comes with a lot of jobs and it, it affects the local economy. Lots of dams were built, lots of irrigation networks were built. Um, agricultural lands got expanded. Now you divert the water, which is flowing into a lake uh, for, for any sort of use, let's say beneficial use in this case, because you are making profit off of, out of it. But, but then you're cutting that, that water from, from the lake. So if no one, you know, so water, the lake has an input, the water which was flowing into it and an output, the water which evaporates from its, its surface. And the Lake Rumi is a shallow lake. Now you cut the inflow, the lake goes dry. That's, that's very simple thing. Now, when it, it is that simple, you would think like, why didn't they think about it, right? Let me tell you that we have seen this problem in many places around the world and Iran is not unique, not far from, from Lake Rumia, we had the Aral Sea problem. We even actually with, with some colleagues, the Iranian colleagues, we, we wrote a paper a, f a few years ago and called it, you know, an, an Aral Sea syndrome. Uh, we, did, we did have the same problem in, in Utah and, and, you know, Southern California. So we have seen this problem in many places. Technocrats, engineers like myself go in and say, we got the solution. We have, a, you know, we can't build a dam, store the water and not thinking about what is happening. Now, in case of Zayan de Root, same thing. Um, development and development and development without thinking about the capacity of the region. Now, in, in case of Zayan de Root, history matters. The question to ask is, that's the question you guys need to answer also and help on, is why did Iran start developing inland? Why are we so far from the coast? Because the whole, you know, the, all, the world likes uh, to place people um, near, near the coast. And we have the Persian Gulf in, in, in the south and the Sea of Oman. Why, why did we go inland? History, of course, has, a, has an answer for you there. It was, you know, concerns about the invasions and also, you know, so many things. So we took everything inland, industries and so many things inland. Then people start residing there. They, they, they grew, industries grew, um, agriculture uh, grew there. The need for water increased. We tried to divert more water to the region. We transferred more water to, to Zayan Derud indeed. But what happened? At the end was the growth got bigger, neutralized actually the effect of the increase in supply. And, and what we saw is, is what we call a fix that backfires um, um, syndrome or archetype that, that you have a pain in your body because you have a headache, let's say, uh, because of an infection, um, because of COVID-19. And you don't realize that you have infection or COVID-19, right? So you take painkillers. Um, you you take painkillers, the symptom goes away, but you know the virus is affecting your lungs and 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 soon there might no not be any recover chance for recovery because this the what needs a, a, a cure is something else in the system. We have focused too much on the symptoms, not the cause of, of the problems. And and if you look at if you go around the country, you see the same problems. The same problems that we have in California for example, uh, what, what did we do in, in California? Uh, people went to Southern California for gold. Um, you know, gold mining was a motive, a major motivation, but start decided to stay there. Now, 
Southern California is dry, um, but it's, it, the dryness hasn't stopped it, it, its growth. Uh, population has, has kept increasing in the region. You might know that two thirds of water in California is supplied from um, the Sa San Francisco, um, Sacramento, Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta near the Bay Area. So we take, the California takes all that water downstream, goes through the Central Valley, feeds the agriculture, and then takes it to the urban, urban areas down there. They even pump water upstream. You know, we, in engineering, we say water always goes downstream. No, downstream, water flows toward money. They got money and they move the water, you know, that way. And, and they haven't been able to stop that, that, that issue. It gets out of control. Now, Dust Bowl, we had Dust Bowl in the United States, right? In Oklahoma. But, yes. So, <laughs> but, but the resilience of the, the systems, the economies are different. And that is a very important thing um, to note that, yes, when it comes to environmental problems, a lot of people like myself talk, engineering, environmental scientists, and so on. But we, we, we don't, again, talk about the major, major causes and the things that we don't have expertise in. And one of those things is, is the political economy of the, of the region that we have to pay attention to. Well, that, that's great. That's giving us a lot. And I'm, and I'm glad to see that the questions are uh, coming in here. Um, let me sort of begin a, a new topic related to everything that you've said, but I'm sure I think it's even coming up in some of the questions. And maybe we can start with this uh, discussion now, and then we can transition to the uh, Q&A. And that, of course, is uh, the, the issue of sanctions on Iran. And when we think of the, the sanctions regime that's been on Iran basically since 1979, um, how has that affected, I mean, we think of it as an economic issue uh, and a political issue, uh, but how has it filtered into the, the kind of work that you do? How, how does it become a, an environmental issue? So, so as always, when it comes to the issue of sanctions, you know, the debate is very heated. Um, just like climate change, sanctions can be used by, by the incapable <laughs> policymakers um, to justify this situation, right? So you can always the problem, this is, this is the situation, you know, I, I, I keep telling the people in the West that they have to be careful about what they're doing with, for example, climate change, any flood, any fire, like, you know, anything with extraordinary, any disaster, we in the West like to climatize it because we want to get the attention of the administration, the President Trump, now President Biden. So, so we have that sort of bias and the media likes it. Um, that here might, might result in an effect. Over there, actually, this is a gift. If you do that in, when it comes to a problem in the Middle East or any part of the developing world, actually, you're giving a gift to the local decision maker because then an Iranian leader can say that, look, we didn't do this problem. This is climate change. It was out of control. We couldn't do anything about it. This is unprecedented. This is flood, you know, too much rain. And who caused climate change? These Westerners were now not willing to take action on it and pay you know, cover the cost of it. So same thing for, for the, for, you know, when it comes to the sanctions. Did, you know, are, is climate change the cause of Iran's environmental problems? Not at all. Is it playing a role? Yes, it is functioning as a catalyst because it's changing the hydrologic regime. It's changing the temperature. It is changing a lot of things in, in, on the ground. But what is happening locally is, is by far more important than, than, than climate change. The land use changes, the decisions you made, the infrastructure you placed, your development plans, population growth and urbanization and so many other things. Now, come to the sanctions debate, same thing. Did sanctions play a role? Yes, sanctions, you know, environment is an inevitable victim of the sanctions imposing and evading game because it's a game, like, you know, the United States comes up with a policy, Iran develops a response strategy. That's, that's you know, any, anyone who understands the game of, ch you know, chess or, or, or poker knows that the other side is also playing something, you, you know, it's not gonna sit down and, and watch what you're doing. So, so there is, environment becomes an inevitable victim of this game. Why? Because at the time that there is, there are sanctions, at a time that, I have a hard time buying a technology. I can simply say, 
that I don't have access to it. Let's not do it. And that has happened in Iran. Now, is it justified? No, but, but we have seen the vice president, for example, issuing a letter saying that let's not, let's not put catalysts on the diesel, um, diesel vehicles in, in, in Iran because, because we can't buy the catalysts. The question you need to ask those people who blame everything on sanctions is, is that how come you, you managed to build missiles? How come you managed to build you know, this sort of technology and that sort of technology or acquire it like you, you paid extra for it and you somehow bought it? How come you didn't do it for the environment, right? So that's a, that's a legitimate question to ask when people blame it all on sanctions. Um, the answer to that is, is also available. A country which has a certain ideology its leaders are, you know, having a certain ideology, or you know, and it's pursuing its ideology is not willing to to give up on its ideology for the sake of the environment. So you won't, you should not expect any Iranian leader to say that because we 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 have air pollution now in Iran, we are not going to. Uh, we are not. We are going to stop the nuclear en enrichment program and 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 deal with the with the West to solve our environmental problems and buy this technology and that technology or or in improve the quality of of the gasoline that we produce. This is the problem that the imposing parties need to understand that there are unintended consequences in the environmental space. Now. There, there are different ways of impact. So one of them, for example, in the case of Iran, and these are all in the report that I published in, in December that you can, you can uh, have a look at. Uh, foreign aid, uh, foreign international aid to the environment was caught. Millions of dollars. Now, millions of dollars is small for a country like Iran compared to the millions of dollars that Iran spends elsewhere, actually out of its borders, right? The money it, it sends to, to its allies. But that, that, that money that was caught from Iran, the, the international aid money, money from Jeff, World Bank, and other institutions, global intergovernmental agencies, that money was going to the environmental groups. That money was going to the NGOs. That money was going to the environmental interest group, the Department of Environment. Those, those entities, those individuals have lost their support. So it has a huge impact. Now, another thing is, is technology, a lot of times. You, 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 you impose sanctions on the oil and gas industry, what would be their response? Would they stop producing gasoline? Did this happen in, during Obama time? President Obama imposed sanctions on Iran, you know, gasoline. What did they do? They produced low quality gasoline and, and let people drive their cars because, because having no gasoline can end your regime, your system, but air pollution will not. Air, you know, air pollution has an episode. An episode comes, people get angry two, three days if there is no wind, the temperature, weeks even, and, and then you cope with it, people get used to it, and, and you kind of handle this crisis until the next wind and the next rain and the next season, and you kind of you know, manage your system that way. But if there is no gasoline, your system ends. There is no fuel, your system ends. And, and this, is, this is something we need, to, we need to understand. So access to technology gets limited. You don't sell technology to Iran. The leaders over there are not gonna stop the development. They indeed sometimes uh, even, even get more aggressive saying that we can implement this, we can do this. Like, you know, uh, and I say in the case of Iran, um, the whole ban on Iran, the revolution and whatever happened afterwards increased the thirst for development in Iran. We wanted to prove that we can stand on, or, on our own feet. We can build our own infrastructure. We became a top dam builder in, in, in you know, top, one of the top three dam builders in, in, in the world. So, so we took all these actions and we, didn't, we, we wanted to prove that no one can stop us. But the most important impact, so some of these impacts are short term, the most important impact is on the political economy. The economy of Iran, if, if, it's managed, it's, if it's not managed properly and it's not being managed properly, right now, you know, again, you cannot blame it on sanctions, but sanctions have played a role. The economy, through the course of development, economies you know, start, this is simply put, you start with, normally, you start with agriculture, you expand your agricultural sector, 
uh, you gain income, you, you know, you, you industrialize your ag agricultural sector, technology comes into the game, you start building your industries. All of these at the beginning happen within your own borders. You grow and, and after a while, while when you, you get industrialized, then you start importing material, you have power to purchase things, you, you, you start diversifying your economy, you sell service and buy goods. This is the on for a game that we play in the world. We don't talk much about it, uh, but, but this is the game we're playing. All the, all the goods we buy on, purchase on Amazon, right? What, where, where are they being produced? Who's, who has to cope with the pollution? Um, we don't talk much about that and we don't, we don't like talking about it. But so, so, so what happens is, is that, for example, the Europeans have a lot of water, but, but they purchase food, a lot of food from Africa. Africa, which is suffering from lots of problems, uh, can't afford building even water infrastructure and lots of other infrastructure. They provide the food at a cheap price and, and they purchase service and technology at a huge price. If you put yourself in that position, you can play a good game. You have a strategic advantage and you can play, play a good game. Now, our, we have tried to build our strategic advantage through reliance on oil. An oil-based economy, which always, and, and other Middle Eastern countries are in the same boat. The, we, we sell oil and buy technology. We sell oil and don't like buying food. In the case of Iran, the Iranian leaders have seen Saddam Hussein issues have seen uh, problems you know in in other parts of the world they have par paranoia about food security so they they even said we are going to make ourselves self-sufficient that's another issue that we have had because they feel threatened they have seen actions threats and and they 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 know that if there is no food and if there is hunger that's the end of the system so for them producing food at any cost is justified what, even if that's, that cost us the, the water that we have inherited from our ancestors, our groundwater. We exhaust all resources for our, our ideology. We want to stand on our own feet. Plus, we have this delusion. Um, again, again, Saudi Arabia is not like Iran. They had a better relationship with the West, if, you know, whatever, however you want to interpret better. But Saudi Arabia in the 90s became a wheat exporter. Is that a joke? They did it. How? By exhausting their groundwater. Again, that sort of mentality, I got money, I can solve my problem, I, I will address this issue. Shah of Iran, if you see a lot of interviews he had, he, he was always, you know, a lot of times when he was being questioned about the oil price, his responses were related to the wheat price. So that sort of game is being played there. And if you don't have a competitive advantage, then you have to make yourself self-sufficient or, or, or you, you become more resource exhausted. So the economy of Iran under sanctions have, have not, has not had the power of you know, decoupling itself from natural resources. And I think it has even become more dependent on natural resources. Why? GDP is part of the game. Most importantly, you need to create jobs, employment, is a serious issue that governments need to deal with. President Trump understood this very well, and and he knew who to talk to and how he you know he could justify you know his his decisions. So you need to provide jobs to people. Agriculture is is an easy sector for creating jobs. You always start there. That's why Iran has always played that game. The rest of the Middle East, you know, in some countries, the same thing. You, you get the oil money and subsidize the agricultural sector, cheap or, or, or free water and energy uh, given to the farmers under the name of protection and you know, support of farmers. The farmers produce food inefficiently, but they got jobs. They're not going to get angry. They're not going to migrate. And that is the game we have played. And I, you know, I, I said this when I was in, on the government that we have to, we have to be honest. This is the issue. It's, it's the, you know, in, employment. And as long as we cannot provide jobs we, in alternative sectors, there is no solution uh, to our problems. Now, yes, you, you can create band-aids, desalinate and transfer water like the plans that Iran is now pursuing. 
600 kilometers like pipeline desalinate water and pump it up it's it's crazy with that amount of money you can you can do lots of other things and you can import um you know uh, a lot of products but that's that's what they're pursuing and and again iran is not the only one you go to dubai a city which was built in 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 recent decades um had had no problem like sanctions it didn't have a war but the mentality over there, you know, resulted in, in having a city which has water insecurity issues, air pollution, traffic, and lots of other things. They had access to the best consultants in the world. They could afford it, but still that mentality has resulted in the outcome that we are seeing. So combine that with the, the problems that Iran um, is experiencing. Yes, sanctions have played a role. And unfortunately, um, it's, a, you know, it, it's a gift to different people within the system who can always justify their bad actions and bad decisions and blame them on sanctions. Well, good. Maybe we can try to transition to some of the questions from our uh, our studio audience here. And I'm seeing a number of questions, a lot of very good ones. Obviously, won't be able to answer all of them. But um, picking up on your last theme, uh, this is a question, if I can just summarize it. This is what will happen when water is depleted, uh, mass outmigration, severe conflicts among wet and dry regions, wars. Uh, we know the Iranian government has no idea how to fix the problem. So, I mean, are, can you sort of anticipate water being a source of conflict within the region, or even as a social problem, political problem within Iran? Will, will it reach that? Since you're talking about the water issue, so so um, you know, some some political leaders, some famous figures, especially in the last you know, century talked about the next war being over water and the location they, they specified was, was the Middle East. Um, that that um, story, that I think um, story or narrative has been rejected. And the reason why is, is that, you know, nations fighting over water is, it seems, um, um, you know, for, for nations to fight over water, to go on a war, war over water, um, there must be an outcome. Like, you know, some, you, you must need a, a, a pleasant outcome. What are you gonna gain by, by going a, on a war with water? So Iran going on a war with, Iraq going on, uh, going uh, on a war with Iran over water. If, if, they ha if, if that, that happens and the objective is, is having access to more water, then you have to occupy parts of the land of, of, of Iran. So, or Iran and Africa, Afghanistan, you know, they have conflicts over Her Hermand or Helmand, you know, as the Afghans call it. So we have to go and uh, Iranians have to go and occupy, you know, Afghan lands. That seems, I would say, um, less likely in the modern world. Although we, you know, in, in the last few years, we have seen all sorts of unusual things and all, uh, all sorts of unexpected stuff. But, but, but what we have seen throughout the history is that we have never seen two, two countries going on a war only for water. We have never seen two nations uniting only over water. Water has been, again, uh, used as, as a weapon to threaten or as a good to create uh, unity. Uh, water can, can catalyze cooperation. Or, or conflicts, so it can be used in your, you know, in in your uh, games with your neighbors. You can talk about it, but going on a war with a neighbor is unlikely. Now you come to inside the country. How is that going to change things? We have seen conflicts, and we are seeing conflicts. For example, in the United States, between states over 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 water, we are seeing conflicts between provinces in, in, in Iran over water. Zayan Deru that you mentioned is a good example. So there is a conflict between Isfahan, Yazd, even um, Kerman, Khuzestan, Charmahal, Bakhtiari over, over you know, the water, transfer of water and everything which is happening in that part. As you go down you know, in the level of users, water users, the level of conflicts can increase. So farmers might kill each other for water because for them, water is their life, it's their income. But as you go up in, in the ladder, the chance of hard, hard conflict or weaponized conflicts would, 
would would uh, reduce. So at the lower level, with more more water shortage, we see more tension, more conflicts, and even even violence. As we have seen, for example, in 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 the case of water transfer in Iran, there have been instances that that people expo exploded the, the the transfer pipe. Um, there were people who were who were killed in in demonstrations and strikes, and so so we see these things. But but to say that you know, for example, countries would go on a war for water, I don't think that's that's the likely thing. Uh, here's another question uh, that I think you might have a good perspective on, uh, relating to um, Iranian government policy towards uh, environmental protection. Uh, it says here, you mentioned NGOs, uh, but of course, M NGOs can only do so much. Is there any support from the government? In, in general, how would you characterize the, the environmental movement you know, within the government institutions in Iran? And, and what are they doing? Maybe that's the way to summarize that question. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, you know, we are seeing a change. The level of, um, you know, the, the amount of conversations and, and, and statements about the environment um, ha, ha, have, has grown in, in, inside the government. If you just analyze you know, the statements from governmental government, you know, the actors in the system and what they have said about the environment. But one reason for that is, is the problems, the environmental problems of Iran, because we are, you know, the awareness, which I mentioned, came at a cost. We have seen the problems and this awareness has come afterwards. So it's the after the fact um, problem, type of thing. So the problem uh, we have is, is the, although concerns have increased and, and pressure on the government has increased, um, we are not seeing, you know, a, a, a change in the policies of the government and, 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 and a radical change in, 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 in the, the attitude or development plans. Part of that reason is, is you know, the ideology that the system has and its economy. Again, political economy problem. For you, if Iran wants to solve its water problems, and I think this applies to other environmental problems in Iran as well, Iran needs to decouple its economy from water. To do that, Iran needs to create alternative jobs, take, take the farmers to the industrial sector. That gives Iran comp competitive advantage when it comes to exporting goods and buying some, some material like food related material. So Iran can produce more food with less people in the agricultural sector and less area actually, farming area. If, if, if it creates jobs for the farmers in alternative sectors. But because it can't do that or is not planning to do that or is, is not seeing the problem this way, then it's, it's not happening. Now, again, Department of Environment, I work for it. The, the, you know, they invited me to Iran. At least some people thought that you know, there, there is a need for a change. We saw the reaction and what happened to me and other environmental activists in Iran, these are the stories that we are seeing. So there are battles between the environmental groups like everywhere in the world, the environmental groups and, and um, those who want to make profit and pursue their, 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 their financial plans and, and, and development plans, construction plans. But, but in Iran, things get more complicated because immediately you get um, accused of working for the enemy and, and you become being a spy and infiltrating the system and so on. And because the system has an ideology, it's easy to, to you know, remove people from the scene and get rid of them. Um, so it is hard for, for people to make a change. Now, I was in the Department of Environment. The Department of Environment doesn't make decisions for for how to cope with sanctions, how, how to develop further, how to allocate the budget, um, where to construct and where to not construct, uh, changing even even water, uh, you know, food policies, birth uh, population control policies, population placement policies. All of these are not controlled by the environmental sector. Now, Iran is no exception. You know, other parts of the world we have in in other parts of the world we have the same issue. But the level of communication and coordination in the poor economies and economies which are struggling with other things. Um, is 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 lower, and that is why Iran is having these problems. I'm not justifying, you know, uh, the the situation, but I'm saying that the hands of a lot of people who are working in the environmental sector are tied 
because others in other parts of the system are making a decision to build a refinery, to, to expand the oil and gas industry, to, to pursue their, their, their you know, uranium enrichment plans and, and so on. So, so there is a limit to how much they can deliver and how much they can do. Now, there are other issues. Sugar cane industry is an example. We all have heard about the strikes of, of the, with those who work uh, for the Haftapen, in Shekera Haftapen in, um, in Khuzestan, for the sugar cane industry. Um, sugar, you know, the, the development in Khuzestan, um, especially the agricultural development, borrowed a lot of lessons. And um, unfortunately, probably wrong, wrong, um, wrong uh, lessons from from the U U.S. Um, Tennessee Valley, Valley Authority was was mm -hmm. was something that the Iranians liked, and 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 the Americans who were also in Iran promoted the idea, and and we we know Iranians wanted to make Khuzestan um, 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 a, a a agriculture an agricultural heaven, sugarcane industry, and and the you know the very same you know industry that we are so concerned about and we complain about what is happening to the workers there um, is actually one of the one of the reasons for ag environmental problems one of the major players when it comes to the causes of environmental problems in Khuzestan. now if i go as the department of environment head and and want to intervene and stop this industry to say stop growing sugarcane here What's going to happen? I get fired, of course, because people need jobs. Even even the people who are concerned about those workers will get mad at me, right? They get mad at me because people, you know, for you to think about the environment, you have to be satisfied with other things. If you are hungry, if you're starving, if you you have no income, if you have no shelter, you can care less about the Iranian cheetahs or trees or forest or anything else. This is the nature of humans. When, when the COVID-19 pandemic started, I remember the media, also Iranian media, um, were promoting this, this like, you know, this idea that, oh, the, you know, we are learning a lesson and the world becomes better, the environment is doing better. And I, I was very nervous about these statements, arguing that, yes, it is true for, for a few days, we'll see a blue sky and, and, and some changes, but the economy gets weakened. And if the economy gets weakened, the level of attention to the environmental sector will, will draw. The reason that we get, we pay attention to the environment is that we have passed that stage of, you know, satisfying people with their primary needs, right? The, the the secretary general of the United Nations was did even, you know, made a mistake advising people to go wash their hands uh, to, to f fight with COVID-19, not thinking, not thinking that millions of people in the world don't even have access to clean water and, and sanitation, can't afford that. We, we advise people to stay at home. Can people stay at home in Iran? Can people stay at home in slums in, in India? Um, so, so, you know, I, I was hearing that in Delhi, um, Social distancing means getting out of the house because if you're in, inside your slum, like you're 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 with other people. So these are the thing. These are different. You know the things that we have to pay attention to. So and again, it's not Iran. I was talking to to the head of the environmental agency in, in Afghanistan. In in Iran, in Tehran, I grew up in Tehran. Air pollution is something we we are concerned about when we keep talking about. But when when we say air pollution. We never mean indoor air pollution. We even don't think about it. Most people even don't know that exists. But people in Afghanistan, in Kabul, are dying of indoor air pollution. We're past that stage. If you are, you know, the, the problems we have are, are at, in, you know, are different at different stages of our economy and, and development. And this is something we need to understand. Deputy, Deputy Minister of Yemen, once I was talking to him, and he said, you know, people keep talking about the, the, the security implications of environmental problems down the road. No one is talking about this, the environmental implications of insecurity problems. Right now we're in a war. We, haven't, we, have, we can't afford paying salary to our, to our staff. And for the last so many months, we haven't given salary to our staff. Can I control them? Can I ask them not to get bribes from people? 
and I have written a letter complaining about this endemic tree being burned in this part of the country and people are laughing at me because you know we're in the middle of a war people are burning those trees to stay warm right if people so these this is something we need to understand the people who are struggling with satisfying their primary needs would not think about the environment and if our economy gets worse and worse people have the right to not care about the environment it's it's sad yes we have to think about future generations and common goods and all those things but this is the nature of human being. We, we first think about ourselves and satisfying our needs. And, and yes, of course, we don't have to waste things. We don't have to necessarily adopt the American lifestyle, which is very wasteful in Iran, but, but the Iranians deserve living a good life. And when I negotiated for Iran in international negotiations, I also said the same thing. Iranians deserve living a good life. So we shouldn't compromise our development plans for the you know for stop it because because a problem has appeared that you you don't take responsibility for so when it comes to climate change look at the role of iran and look at the, your role you took the oil you left us with the pollution right you created the problem look at where you are we have benefited from your development as well yes in the united states but but now it's, you know, our people are also wanting to live a better life and they deserve a better life. And you're saying that, oh, there is climate change, which I agree with. And as a scientist, I want this problem to be solved. But as a representative of Iran and the Iranian people, I also care about where my country stands and where, you know, my people are and how they're, they're living and what their life quality is. And, and, and when it comes to that game, I say, you have to pay, pay the price. Give us technology, give us better technology. Yes, we can switch from oil to solar panels, but, but don't expect us to, to pay for this game. And, and you keep blaming, uh, blaming the oil sellers, but not speaking about the oil buyers. How come this, you know, this game is being played? So this is, this is the unfortunate thing. Uh, NGOs cannot change the whole game. Um, as well, the, the people who work for the Department of Environment cannot change the game. Um, look at the United States. President Trump decided that he wants to loosen a lot of environmental policies for the sake of economic development and good economic signals um, to the market. Um, he, he appointed a, a, a person who you know, was not a, a, a pro-environmental person, at least we didn't recognize him as, as that type of a person. And during his time, that that sector got weaker and weaker and 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 um laws were were, were uh, i would say loosened one after another this kind the united states has a lot of environmental activists a lot of environmental scientists and a lot of good people working for the epa but but a you know a higher level manager decision maker had so much power and and, and leverage for intervention and this is the scary part when you pursue Plans, you don't think, you know, your development plans and you're ambitious about growing your economy, you're not thinking about these things. Now, it is different um, in the United States. You know, the United States is different from, from Iran in the stage of development, access to technology and chances for investing in, in alternative sector, of course. Well, thank you for all that. We still have a little bit of time for maybe a couple of other questions. I think we had said we'd go about an hour. We'll try to go a little bit longer than that. We don't want to keep Kabe too long. But uh, and we have a lot of questions. Let me let me try to pick up on a question that I think you you touched a little bit on in your last uh, response. And this might actually come back to the issue of sanctions as well. Is the person that asks. Can you talk about the current state of environmental science programs and professional training at Iranian universities? Uh, and I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, students who want to leave Iran and the travel ban, uh, are they restricted in terms of the, the kind of environmental access to knowledge about environmental science in Iran? Does that affect the programs inside Iran? Uh, maybe you can say about something about that. I mean, generally speaking, again, um, if you look at the sanctions, travel ban, visa problems, and, and even before travel ban, the law passed during, you know, President, uh, was it during President Obama, I think, uh, that, that whoever has traveled to Iran in the last five years 
you know, has to apply for visa, cannot use visa waiver program to come to the United States. We lost, for example, a lot of European visitors for that for that matter. Um, there is also restriction in 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 access to um, to uh, platforms. For example, if you want to go on Coursera in Iran and 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 just have access to an online course, um, environmental course, like any other uh, person on this planet, you cannot because because. Coursera, um, it, you know, is on, under sanctions, cannot uh, support Iranian users. Zoom, by the way, is another <laughs> another platform which is having is is problematic. I know the University of California, for example, um, it, in in one one occasion at least recently, didn't allow Iranians um, to register for an online event, uh, arguing that this platform cannot be used in Iran. Um, so, well, so they're welcome to join us here. <laughs> yes. Um, so the this this you know there are these these sad moments. Um, academic exchanges existed between Iran and, the, for example, Iranian uh, National Academy and the U.S. National Academy before this has stopped. These are not revolutionary. You know, you you shouldn't expect like an American scientist talking to an Iranian scientist, and tomorrow there will be a, a, a big change in Iran. But these are these can facilitate facilitate. Um, a change and 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 you know improvement in science and science diplomacy can always help. Now we are hearing that the travel ban has been lifted. Uh, on, until the this pandemic is gone, we we really can't see the effect um, because visa getting visas for Iranian is still a a, a major. Um, major challenge traveling to other countries and applying for visa is a major problem, but the, you know. Exchanges have been uh, limited. Funding, as I said, has been limited, and also the paranoia that the Iranian security system and intelligence system is now having about the environmental space is is, is causing some problems. Some people might be scared of, of of working with with others. But organically, organically, we are seeing a lot of exchanges between the Iranians uh, inside Iran and and. Iranians outside Iran and their like non-Iranian colleagues, and that is a very good thing. Uh, we we accept a student from Iran; he or she comes with with you know he his or her network of collaborators. We work on a problem on Iran. There is no funding. We work out of our interest, like many many different things we have done in, on Iran, and 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 we we try to inform and to try to raise awareness and try to solve the problem. Interactions are formed. Students. Are, are moving and, and benefiting from this. And this is something positive which is happening. And I, I hope we see more of that. Now, the problem though that we have is we don't have a consolidated unit or platform um, on this side of the world, which is doing environmental related work for Iran, environmental related research for Iran. Although, although we have so many Iran, especially Iranians of my generation, who have you know the children of revolution, born and raised in, after after the revolution, who have migrated from Iran, have their active networks in Iran, can work with the Iranian researchers on on Iranian problems, environmental problems, apolitical in in many cases, and solve Iranian problems or study Iranian problems. We don't have a platform to bring them together. None of our Iranian studies programs have, have a, a, an environmental unit or has been interested in hiring an environmental faculty or an engineer or like, you know, people of this kind. And this is not only about environmental problems in water and agriculture in other, other uh, some other er, special areas, specialty areas as well, uh, engineering areas. Although we have a, a big group of people who are now working on Iran's problems just organically. Um, you know, networks that have been formed unofficially and people who are spending time on Iran out of interest. And that is beautiful. And that is very heartwarming, I think, because, you know, despite all these problems that we talk about, a lot of people, you know, there are people who even can't travel back, don't go home, but are so interested and remain so connected to Iran, trying to understand, trying to solve a problem, and try to do something beyond nagging and, and just blaming the system. Well, that's great. And I think what the work that you've been doing has really been pioneering in that way and really kind of inspirational for all of us, not only that are interested in environmental things, but Iranian studies to try to make that connection uh, with Iran on those kinds of issues. Maybe we have time for just one more question from the audience that I'm seeing. This might be a good question to end on. 
Uh, regarding the Biden administration and the selection of John Kerry as the special envoy for climate, obviously he has got diplomatic background, but now he's got a climate uh, portfolio. Uh, and I'm wondering, or this person is wondering, if uh, that set of experiences, uh, do you think that will help uh, in the Biden administration's policy towards Iran? Towards Iran, I mean that's that's not an environmental question. So so, I mean of course the you know the the, the Biden administration has has I think listened to our um, advices and the, the the advice of the environmental activists and environmental scientists recycling recycling and reuse. We always um, uh, you know. Uh, propose that and ask people to recycle and reuse. So the Biden administration is recycling and reusing a lot of people from Obama time. And those people want to um, recover and restore some of the things they had uh, from before. Some of those can be beneficial uh, to the people of Iran. Some of those can be beneficial to the um, government of Iran, um, whether you know we can argue that they might not be necessarily beneficial to the Iranian public. There are, again, pros and cons there. When it comes to the environment, though, um, yes, this is a you know, nice gesture. And the Biden administration now wants to be uh, serious, more serious about climate change. And we will see some changes. But again, again, it cheap, you know, talk is cheap. We want action. My in my statement in COP23 negotiations, uh, I, I said like we get so too busy, you know, so busy nego negotiating um, the targets that we forget that we need pathways to to um, to reach them. Um, we don't talk about the pathways. How do we get there? How do we implement all these things that we are asking for? And 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 now with the pandemic, yes, we are learning lessons from the nature. But but when the you know the economies are under pressure and they are doing miserably, um, these economies have no interest or bandwidth to cope with with environmental problems, even their their current environmental problems. Um, so thinking about climate change is 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 too much for them. So we would see, I would, I, I think, some noise being made, some leadership uh, by the United States in in the climate change game, and that is that is good. Uh, some changes in industry, some growth in in, in green um, industries, which are all good things. But to expect that President Biden would would do a revolution, I, I mean, I I don't think we can expect that. Yes, you can come. And introduce yourself as as a person who who's like you know 180 degrees different from um, from your former the former president. If and if 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 President Trump said climate change is a hoax, you say this is a serious thing and and you want to take action on it. But you know dealing with the the, the problems, even even the economic problems um, uh, in the next four years in the United States is not easy. Uh, so um, the President Biden will have a lot of domestic problems to deal with, and I don't know how 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 serious he can get about the problems in in in, in the, the the global problems. Uh, the, the next COP negotiations would be in in Glasgow. Now look at the UK with Brexit and and, and COVID nineteen again. Um, it's not in in its good in a good shape. Uh, the previous one that we were supposed to have in Chile right before the negotiations, we had demonstrations and the event got canceled and all the plans and lobbying um, failed. So so we will see some 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 games. Uh, we will see some some pictures and some handshakes, but um, let's you know I think we need to be realistic about how much we can deliver. Let's not forget um, you know I used to see both both of uh, you know <laughs> Emmanuel Macron and his his environmental minister in in some of these events, um, he he made a lot of like you know he, uh, in in negotiations he always was very ambitious, making a lot of ambitious statements. But one of his first ministers who resigned was his environmental minister. So um, so so even even delivering some of the things you promise in the developed world when you don't have the typical um, economic and social problems of the, the global south is 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 hard so we cannot expect too much from the developing nations if we want to bear the cost and to help them yes we can see a change otherwise it's you know ch changing um solving the problems that have been created by our existing institutions uh, through the same institutions is not easy climate change is just one byproduct of sustain unsustainable development something that we are very obsessed with 
and on it's 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 I think it's an unfortunate thing because because we don't talk about the other environmental problems. It, our, our focus on climate change is overshadowing a lot of other environmental discussions. And that creates problems because yes, you, if, if, you know, first of all, even in the developed world, even in the United States, you have a hard time convincing the public about, about climate change being a serious threat, existential threat and so on, right? But, but when it comes to my, you know, my side of the world, if I'm in the developing world and I cannot breathe, um, trees are gone. Um, there is no water. There is no food. Talking about climate change cannot make you know create any panic for for me. I I live somewhere that tomorrow tomorrow that you know they, there might be a war. I live somewhere that the exchange rate of, of the you know the economy um, the economy might might get um, tanked like tomorrow. The the um, the exchange rate might might change as a result of a decision somewhere else in the world, and I lose all my assets and and life. Um, there might be like they might um, be a, a bomb, an attack, an assassination. We don't know what's going to come next. What you know for those people, climate change cannot create concern, and I think this is something that the um, the people, the environmental scientists in the the global north need to understand. Unfortunately their limited understanding of, of, of the gr ground truth and what is happening in the, the other parts of the world create this, this barrier that they keep talking about some problems that don't create, like, you know, don't create any goosebump for us. Uh, if instead, if instead they talk about other environmental problems that, that solving them can create immediate benefits for the communities in, in other parts of the world. Let's say, for example, doing something about water in Iran, doing something about food production and agriculture and deforestation or, or air pollution in Khuzestan because of the oil industry or soil pollution, doing something on that. Let's say um, reducing um, the flare gas that Iran is burning in, in the oil and gas zones that have an immediate benefit for the people of Khuzestan, less cancer, be better health conditions, less pollution and so on. If we sell that idea, if we talk about that, that thing, there is a package which has immediate benefits and Iranians would welcome it, Iranian public would like it. Does it help climate change? Tremendously because it's, it's all about reducing carbon emissions. But if you only talk about carbon emissions and don't talk about their problems, then you cannot create this, this um, I would say, connection. That is why that Iran has been reluctant to, to ratify the Paris Agreement. One of my accusations is actually efforts to ratify the Paris Agreement and limit development in Iran, believe it or not. So, so these are the things that we need to understand. If we want to help those you know, people in other parts of the world, let's understand their problems. Let's understand wh what they are dealing with and see if we can create any immediate benefit out of the solution for them. The talk, our conversation was in my, about environmental security and I, I, I quoted the, the Yemen deputy minister. Um, but re, you know, let me end the conversation with, with reminding people that again, um, this is something that we in the West must understand better that environmental security is not the typical thing that we have understood in the past. Um, the typical thing that is, is being promoted by the defense and intelligence communities that climate change and environmental degradation can cause conflicts in the future. Yes, they can. Uh, they can cause migration and tension and so on. That, that is one side of the story. The other side of the story is that, that in what, Environmental problems themselves can be created by tensions, wars, economic uh, problems, um, corruption, and so many other things. Um, so, so we have a loop that we need to deal with. You cannot go to Yemen and right now focus on environmental problems and disregard everything else on the ground. You cannot go to Syria and try to address environmental problems and disregard everything else. You cannot go to Afghanistan, Iran, elsewhere to do this because they have so many other things to deal with. And if you don't fix their economy, if you don't fix their governance system, if you don't do things in, in that part of the, you know, this reinforcing loop, then there is no, um, you know, you are not addressing the solution. Unfortunately, we have, you know, we are reductionists, especially engineers and a lot of natural scientists. We only think about our, 
are part of the problem. We focus on it, we dig deeper and deeper and deeper without understanding the bigger picture and all the complexities in the system. That is why our narratives a lot of times don't even make sense to people in, 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 in other disciplines <laughs> within academia. Uh, so, you know, imagine how our narratives would sound to, to some people who are starving or, or under, under war or, you know, living in, in, in war conditions and in conflict zones and don't have access to, to water, food, clean air, clean, clean you know, health, better health conditions and so on. Well, Kaveh, you, you've given us uh, a lot to think about and you've definitely demonstrated how interconnected and complex all of these issues are. And I think I've never heard anyone sort of explain how interconnected the environmental issues are with the political and the economic, uh, especially in the Iranian context, as well as you have. I guess it kind of makes it, makes it a little bit difficult to be optimistic, but we can still be determined and hopeful. And I think you, you don't definitely uh, demonstrate that uh, as well. We don't want to take any more of your time. Joshua, do you want to take out, take us out of this or say the goodbyes? Afshin uh, just, just sorry, you know, before we end, because we, we said this, you, you know, I think we still have to remain optimistic. <laughs> Appreciating complexity is not equal to losing hope. When, when the problems get complex and we cannot interpret them, or explain them to people with, 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 with a simple language, there is a big risk. Um, the conspiracy theorists are the winners because people need something to, you know, for these in mind. Well, I need an explanation. And come and tell us that there's the enemy who's doing this. There are these hidden hands which are doing this. There is, you know, there is something which is causing the, the these problems. So complexity is hard to explain, but 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 we have to try harder. We have to tell people that yes, we cannot change things overnight, but there are baby steps that we can take. There we cannot you know change all these policies, but we still can raise awareness. We can inform the technocrats within within Iran. We can. In, you know, empower the environmental activists and the, the, the public in Iran with more knowledge, better knowledge, better access to information and, and change their expectation, change the way they think about the, the problems around them and, and the environment. And I think here we have a good example, the pandemic. The pandemic is a complex problem. And I, another thing here, complexity is not equal to, you know, complex is not equal to complicated. There is a big dis distinction between the two. Even in Persian, we translate them in, in the same way. Even in English, we use them interchangeably. A complicated problem is like finding a vaccine for COVID-19. It happens eventually, we find a drug and we deal, we deal with it. So, you know, addressing the COVID-19 pandemic is a complex problem. When you wanna to touch it, you tell people, you know, to stay at home, Economy starts like, collapsing. You have to do some do something with the economy. Something else is 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 coming, you know, becoming problematic. This problem has no right solution, has no single you know solution, and no no exit strategy. No silver bullets can get out get you out of this problem. Eventually, we'll find a vaccine. We learn from our mistakes and we try to change things. If we lose our hope, environment would be one of the first victims, because we said, like if, if the, those who are hopeless and cannot you know, not think about their future and what happens to them tomorrow will not care about the environment. So we, despite all my, my I think, um, negative or, or let's say pessimistic um, uh, explanations, let's not lose hope and let's try harder because we can deliver more when, and we have a lot to offer. Very good. Well, thank you very much. And thank, thank you, uh, Afshin, as well, for such good questions. And thank the audience. It's really wonderful to see so many people with so many questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them all. Um, thank you, Kavi. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone who joined. خیلی ممنون از هر جای جهان که متصل شدید. ممنون که وقت گذاشتید و گوش دادید و نگاه کردید. That's fair.